Barnes and Noble. We're looking for Gary Vandertruck. Hopefully he'll be in the house tonight. Sorry to make you guys uh, wait a little bit. I, I was feeling so good that I was eight minutes early. <laughs> I was watching Sports Center in my hotel room. I know. Sorry. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, so I wrote a new book. Um, <laughs> thank you, Economy. Uh, I wrote it. Um, I actually wanted to write it first. I actually wanted to write this book before Crush It. Uh, but I didn't feel it was practical enough. One of the things I think that um, has made me somewhat relevant when it comes to business is that, you know, I very much like the new stuff. I like, you know, new technologies. I like new trends. But what I really pride myself in is that, <clears throat> you know, that, I'm, that I'm, I'm not a blogger, that I'm not just, you know, a talking head or pundit. I execute. I, you know, I, I came to this world of being recognized uh, first long before I talked about the things I did, I actually built a business, right? And so I think things need to be practical. I think at the end of the day, if you talk about things that can't be executed, um, it's difficult for people to you know, absorb it or, or actually get real success from it. So when I started like, plotting the first book, I, um, I didn't feel like the thank you economy was ready. I thought what was more practical was crush it, was hey, go do this, this is what happens, you'll get quicker results. This is a, a bigger thought. You know, it's funny, I've read some of the, uh, the reviews have been much better for this book than Crush It on Amazon, but of course I focus on the one star reviews very much. And it's been fun to see like the four or five negative reviews about this book, that it wasn't as action based as Crush It, right? Crush It said, go get a Tumblr account, get a flip cam, do this, do that. And I think that has a lot of value. I think what Thank You Economy is, is not a, a theory, but more of a, you know, I use the word economy. Right? And, uh, you know, I'm a grown up. I know the word economy is a big boy word, right? I didn't use the thank you thesis or the thank you period or the thank you, you know. Yeah, exactly. This is a, a very big word. I use the word economy because it's my firm belief that looking around, and this is a very nice, youthful crowd, nobody's retiring in this crowd in the next year or two. I really think that this whole phenomenon that everybody wants to call social media, which I still call Web 2.0, what I know is just the maturity of the internet itself is going to have the single largest impact on commerce in this country, in this world, that we've ever seen. I mean, this stuff that we, I talk about in this book under business context, this stuff is overturning governments in the Middle East, right? Ones that have been in power for decades and decades and decades. This is not small stuff. I mean, this stuff is changing the way we live. This is saving people's lives during you know, earthquakes and tsunamis because they're getting information quickly. I mean, this is changing the world. Do we really have the audacity to sit here and not think this stuff is gonna impact our business? And, and that's what I'm fascinated by. I'm fascinated by, I've been selling stuff since I was four years old, right? I, my first business was pretty raw. It's, I like to say it's lemonade stands, and seven, eight of them, and I used to have this great lemonade stand franchise business, and I threw it around in my big wheels, and picked up my cash like I was Tony Soprano, it was amazing. But my real first business was ripping flowers out of people's yards, ringing their doorbells, and selling it back to them. <laughs> so it's funny for me to think about being that person DNA-wise. I'm all about business. This is selling 101. When I talk about things like thank you economy, like giving a crap about your customer by actually listening to them, one-on-one -on -one marketing, actually caring, all these things I believe in, the 22-year-old version of me makes fun of the 35-year-old version of me. You know, it's all way too zen, right? It's not, you know, it, it, and it's funny for me to think about that, and I don't think it's because I'm getting older and softer, though it's possible. You know, Lewis did beat me in ping pong on the boat, so I'm a little bit upset about that. Um, it, that is possible. But what I think is happening is this. I very much, not our book, not our book, okay. the second book, <laughs> the second book, um, sorry, too many inside jokes. Um, what I think is fascinating is the way people buy is what I care about. I really don't care about Twitter or Facebook 
or iPhone apps, technology. I really don't give a shit about that. I swear, I really don't. None of it interests me. I didn't grow up with computers. I'm not so fascinated by it. I'm not obsessed with Twitter or Facebook. I'm obsessed with the way people buy things and spend their money, period. I'm a businessman. And I think what's shocking to me is the way people are about to do that. See, we've lived through 150 years of push marketing. Everybody who was good at marketing and sold stuff for the last 100 plus years had to be good at what I'm doing right now, giving a presentation. Barnes and Nobles is a good business because they knew how to run commercials, print advertising, radio, direct mail, whatever it was, and whatever business you know that's been successful, McDonald's, Apple, dominant at this, push. We sit back and consume it, we have a filter, we decide it's good, we buy it, we decide it's bad, we don't. That is the way business has been forever. If you were good at business, you were a good storyteller, and you understood how to spend money, time and energy, how to tell your story, it was consumable, consumers executed against it, that was the game. For the first time ever, ever, the consumer, us, we have a collective voice. Now, it's not changing the world, isn't it? It's gonna happen, but, the fact of the matter is, we have gone from a battlefield of giving a presentation as businesses, and that skill set, what I'm doing right now, to the ability to work the room in a cocktail party. And so the battleground for business going forward, and the thing that fascinates me the most, is we've literally gone from the skill set of PowerPoint presentation, is it good, you consume it, to forget about that, it's what happens afterwards, which by the way, I think anybody who's been doing business for more than a couple years knows that's where the real business is done, right? It's done at the ball, the reason you go to the ballpark, you know, you know, definitely not to go see the Indians play, you know, because you're trying to, you know, <laughs> trying to make some action happen, some business happen, and so that fascinates me. What fascinates me is that as I watch all these technologies happen, the skill set that I think it's gonna be needed to be successful in business is more likely something your grandparents are good at, no matter how, Whatever your age is, I'm talking 1910s, 20s, 30s, old school, small town rules. It's fun for me to do you know, events in, in different parts of the US, not just LA and New York, because I think the sensibility of towns like this and other parts of the country is much more in line to what's going to be needed to be successful than the, you know, the coast sensibility. And so that fascinates me. So the question becomes, Something I think a lot of you have heard, what's the ROI of social media, right? Like, why, why do it? Like, what's the value? I hear that every day. I heard it again today with a client. What's the real ROI? Let me paint you a picture of what I think is very scalable if you're willing to go there and something I'm very passionate about. We have a client uh, at VaynerMedia, which is a consulting company. I started with my brother AJ. We do a social strategy and community management for a lot of brands. What that means is we handle their Facebook and Twitter account. Once we understand the voice and engage with users, we have a whole big policy of no tweet left behind. You know, so we think it's crazy for you to let somebody talk about your business right now and not engage with them. Insanity, like why, how? You would never do that in real life if somebody talked about your business and was sitting next to you at the cafe down so you wouldn't let it go. Bless you. Uh, so, we, we engage on our, our brand's behalf, so we also do a lot of strategy of where we think the world's going. What are these new sites like Quora and Ruby and Instagram, and how can they be valuable, these emerging technologies to our clients? One of our clients is Harris Casino Group. So they have Caesars Palace, this and that. There's a, a thing in early January in Vegas called the Consumer Electronics Show, right? All the tech geeks go, it's all hardware, right? Everybody goes, it's a big event. Caesars wanted us to cover it. Watch every conversation with that hashtag, and not even just that hashtag on Twitter. Every conversation that we could see going on on the web around CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, we wanted to watch, monitor, engage with, look at it. On day two, at like two in the morning, somebody tweets out, does anybody know where I can watch the Junior Olympic hockey match in Vegas? I'm at CES. This has nothing to do with anything. One of my people see it, we hit up Caesars Casino Group, we ask the sports book, we call them physically, and ask them, you know, do you guys have this playing in the sports book? They said yes, could we reserve a table? Yes. We got the person's name from Twitter, we hit it up, we got a table, we tweeted at the person, a couple other people saw them, they had four or five people, they went, very nice. Super great, right? Great, we're nice people. I don't care about being nice. What I care about is what happened the next day. The next morning, that person tweeted, checking out of the win, checking into Caesars. Thanks for the help. That's what I call ROI. 
And the reason I'm so obsessed with social media is because consumers are putting out data, micro data, to the world that we never used to do. Every person here that's familiar with following somebody on Facebook or Twitter or using the products knows that they will see something tomorrow morning that looks something like Tropicana orange juice is yummers. <laughs> we are saying things like this latte from Pete's is delicious, Snickers bars are my life, whatever we're saying, we are saying things publicly, data that we can see now as businesses that we would never pick up the phone and call our friends about. The amount of things that we're putting out on a daily basis in micro context on these platforms are things we would have never even called one friend about. But now, because of the infrastructure that has been created, we are saying things that are affecting people's buying habits, not knowingly, or knowingly, depending on how much you're paying attention, and we're sharing it with every person we know. And if you know anything about business, you know that word of mouth matters. That word of mouth closes. That that is the equity when it comes to business. And we are living through a revolution with word of mouth. We're living through an era where word of mouth is on steroids, I like to say, right? Word of mouth is hanging out with Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. And it matters. And so these are the things I've been paying attention to, but there's a lot of ways to look at it. How many of you here are familiar with um, the Old Spice campaign, where the, the Old Spice guy went on YouTube, made a bunch of videos. Just curious, how many of you are familiar with that? Raise your hand, I wanna get a context. Amazing, very savvy crowd here. To put into context for some people that might not be aware of this, Old Spice had that campaign, Mustafa, the guy, who, you know, handsome, you wish your man was like me. They did the whole Super Bowl thing, it went really well. They then took the actor, he made 100 videos on YouTube, personalized. They used Twitter to, engage people to show them that they made videos for them. They were even as savvy as going into different parts of the internet like reddit.com, all these different communities. They executed, in my opinion, a perfect play on using traditional media to create context and then leveraging new media to extend the story. <coughs> they went one-on-one. -on -one. I believe one-on-one -on -one marketing is here. And it came out and they got 175,000 followers on Twitter out of it in 24 hours. And everybody from ad age to any social media expert and guru has been tripping over themselves for the last year that it's the greatest thing that ever happened in social media. And then I went ahead and wrote in this book that it sucked shit. And I'm gonna tell you why. A couple reasons. Number one, if you leave with anything tonight, there's really two main things that I want you to leave with. Number one, that I'm dramatically better looking in person. <laughs> That's Not funny. Even, that is a little bit of a clam shot. You're right. <laughs> 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 I'm on the wine show. <laughs> Number two, that there is no such thing. And this is the important part. That there is no such thing as a social media campaign. It does not exist. It gets thrown out a lot. People say it a lot. Every client asks me what our campaigns are going to be, and the answer is none, because social media is the first platform ever that is relationship-based and not push-based. It's like parenting. You don't parent for like six months. You're always in. You have kids? Forever. <laughs> Forever. So social media is a relationship. A social media campaign is a one-night stand in a world where you need to go Beyonce on your customers and put a ring on it. Mm -hmm. You like that? <laughs> Not bad, right? You didn't like it? Come on. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very serious about this in the midst of a Beyonce joke. I, I, the reason I think a lot of people, listen, I have not promoted my events really outside of like retweeting somebody on the day of you know, at all. And, and I really, really appreciate how many people came out. Some may come out because other people have been passing on the word, but I know that a lot of people are here because I have context with them. I have relationships with them. And they may be because I've met and spent time on, you know, different events or that I've engaged with quite a bit on the social webs. But I look around here and I have different feelings towards some people that I have never even met before. But I've engaged so much with them online that I have a relationship with them. There's people here who I've not spent a whole lot of time with, but I have very much a feeling towards because I just had a conversation with them two hours ago. I knew they were coming. I knew they were driving three hours to be here. And I think that that's what I'm obsessed with. I think everybody in this room has heard the word con or the statement, content is king. The word that I'm obsessed with is context. What happens 
when you start creating context in a scalable way, that to me is the belief of what social media, Web 2.0, the maturity of the internet creates. That I know a lot of people here tonight, they bought my book, they've supported my stuff, because I've created context with them. Because I've taken the time to answer hundreds of thousands of emails, hundreds of thousands of tweets, spent countless hours on Ustream lip syncing to Britney Spears, whatever it may be, I've created some form of context for people in this room, and that's what matters, and that's what converts, and I think that is the scalable battleground in a world when you start looking at what traditional media and push marketing has to face. How many people here do not have a television? Raise your hand. All right, that's three. That's about three more than would have not had a television 15 years ago. How about this? How many people here have a DVR or a TiVo? Raise your hand. Okay, most people. How many people here fast forward every single commercial based on what they take on television? Please raise your hand fully. Don't bullshit me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. There are 23 people here. Here, just here. Good old, you know, a lot of Ohio State swag, but just, you know, middle of Ohio. 23 people here who do not watch a single commercial. So, it's 2011, yet we're paying for media like it's 2003. We're living in culture shifts that are massive. How many people here watch television with at least one other device by them? Raise your hand. <laughs> the far majority of people here watch television with at least a laptop in front of them, probably a phone and a laptop, and if you get really sick like me, phone, laptop, and iPad. Three other <laughs> devices while I watch television. So why are, why are commercials not extending the story when the commercial runs, when they have a captive audience ready to be activated and send them onto the social web to do something and collect data? Why is that not happening? Why am I petrified to drive tonight? I'll tell you why. Because people aren't looking at billboards outside. They're not even looking at the road. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but if you drive tonight, I guarantee one in every other per one in every two people is texting if you look at them. If you drive tonight and you look over, I promise you, one in every other person is texting while they drive. We don't need mothers against drug driving. We need mothers against texting. We need mad. We don't need mad. I mean, there are major culture shifts going on in our society. The average 14-year-old girl is sending 4,100 texts and making 3.3 .3 phone calls. If a girl 14 years old, and I'm only 35, when I was 14, only made three and a half, she made three and a half phone calls an hour. There are major culture shifts going on. The way we're gonna reach people is changing. Soap operas have been in business forever. They're one of the few things that came from radio to television. Guiding Light's been on for like 740 years. <laughs> and what has put Guiding Light out of business and all these shows? Farmville. <laughs> yeah. You want to know why soap operas are closing and they're shutting out? Because their normal demo, if you look at the data, is now playing online games all day. They're going to Facebook and mom or dad, stay at home dad, whoever was watching soap operas now spends 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. playing Farmville because that's the hyped, by the way, hours. Not, at, not the time you thought. Not 10 p.m. to 2 in the morning. The height is 1 to 7 p.m. Eastern to Western, depending on that time zone. They have totally taken away soap operas. So if you're Tide or Dove or whatever company that wants to reach that demo, you now have to have virtual goods and branding in these games, not run commercials during days of our lives. These are substantial culture shifts. What I write about in this book are these culture shifts, why they're happening, and most of all, how I think companies can be successful. And here's the thing, guys, and I'll, I want to do a lot of Q&A. I don't want to just talk all day, because I talk a whole lot about it being about engagement. I don't want to just give it a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do the cocktail party. There's a lot of money in play, and there's a lot of opportunity in play. Innovation doesn't stop for anybody. There were seven very smart men sitting in a room in 2002, which, oh, by the way, is five minutes ago, and Dick said to John, John, have you heard about this uh, Netflix thing? What do you think? No, Dick, I don't know. Rick? Yeah, I saw it, but whatever. Steve? I could care less. John? Nobody's going to put their credit card into a computer. And seven years later, Blockbuster is out of business. 
if, you know, if IBM, when they were a leader, were so smart, they would have never let Microsoft happen. If Microsoft was so unstoppable, they would have never let Google happen. Google would have never let Apple happen, Facebook happen. Facebook would have never let Twitter happen, and on and on and on. Innovation is not going to stop for anybody. It's gonna always disrupt. I mean, we're standing in one of the places that only one of the few companies that's been able to withstand one of the innovations in the book industry, right? You know, every small bookstore I go into, if I even say Amazon, they like slice my like, life up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, by the way, Amazon's like five minutes old. Guys, seven years ago, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter did not exist. Seven. So, what happens next? In a world where, I don't know if you guys saw this quote, Eric Schmidt, former CEO, now chairman of Google, came out and released some really interesting data. He said, there's as much content being produced from the beginning of mankind, so the first day, you know, like grab the apple, eat it, that whole thing, that first day, the first day of mankind, until 2003, every song, every book ever written, every Walter Cronkite, you know, every Beatles song, and not just America, the whole world, everything we produced, every picture, painting, written word, audio, video, every piece of content we produced from the beginning of mankind until 2003 is now being replicated in volume every 48 hours. Wow. Let's all stop right now. Let's all hold hands. <laughs> I want everybody to wrap their head around this because this is not minor and this goes to the thesis of why things, I think things are gonna change. Every 48 hours, we create as much music, print, words, video, pictures, information as we did from the beginning of mankind until 2003. Wow. So no shit our kids have ADD, right? <laughs> no wonder. They need to. Right, they need to, to survive. No <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, let, let, you know, let's really wrap our head. Uh, no wonder it feels so fast. No wonder there's, everybody's texting short form. There's so much being thrown at us. There's so much being produced. So what breaks through? You think content is king? I promise you, the 30 best books in this store don't sell. I mean, you know, who knows, but right? I mean, there is amazing content being produced on a daily basis. That is not what is going to break through. Content is a commodity. You used to have a dinner conversation, it was good that you were smart and knew things and you could have a great conversation. Now I go out to dinner, guys like, well, the seventh president, you know, I don't give a shit, I know the seventh president right here. You wanna know who the seventh president? There he is. Content, <laughs> content is a commodity. I used to be pumped that I knew the score of Super Bowl every Super Bowl. Now, pull it up, two seconds. Wikipedia, Super Bowl three, 16, seven, right? So, that was the one the Jets won. So, <laughs> So there are these a massive, massive dynamics being in place. And so what breaks through, in my opinion, what I'm seeing break through, what I've seen happen in my business, what I see happening in other businesses, watching what's been happening the last five years, the businesses that are breaking through are not breaking through on content, they're breaking through on intent. They're breaking through on what their intent is. And that to me feels a whole lot like 1925. When you walked into the butcher's shop and he started cutting your roast beef and he knew your sister's name and he knew everything about you because we are creating context now that we know a lot more about each other. We all here collectively know a lot more about each other than we would have because what we're doing for our Facebook status, our pictures on Flickr, our Instagram shots, what we're doing is we're doing stuff that we used to do in the old days. We used to keep our front door open. We used to literally hang our laundry outside. Like you knew what people wore because their laundry was outside. Like you knew everything. You knew everything, you stayed in a contained box, everything was small town, and what technology is now doing is replicating that small town just at the biggest scale. And we have new context, and businesses' opportunity to engage with customers based on their information is very powerful. The thank you economy is not about social media. The thank you economy is about this. Let me give you an example. We have a thank you department now at Wine Library, which is very different than customer service. Customer service is playing defense. It's reacting to a problem. I like offense. And so we now have a thank you department. Kay Murph at Wine Library is in charge of the thank you department. I was talking to her and I said, listen, I'm going on the book tour, the book's about to come out, I need some good case studies to paint the picture. Let's do something. Next interesting order, first time customer, let me know. She contacts me a day later, 
guy spends $25,000 on his first wine order from Chicago. I go, Kristen, find out who he is on Facebook or Twitter. She finds his Twitter account, searches his name, Twitter, can match up, it's in Chicago, everything lined up, say that. We follow him for the next six weeks and we watch everything he says. We realize that all he says are the following. Jay Cutler, I love you. Jay Cutler, you're the best. Hackers, I hate you. We're definitely going to beat you. Welcome to Chicago, bitches. We're going to kill you. <laughs> love you. I love you. Jay Cutler, oh my god, don't be hurt. We would have won the game if Jay Cutler wasn't hurt. We're coming back next year. Jay Cutler's the man. Jay, Jay Cutler. The guy likes Jay Cutler. <laughs> Jay Cutler's the quarterback of the Chicago Bears, for some of you who might not know. This is the information that Kristen gives me. I say, Kristen, I want you to go to eBay. I want you to buy a Jay Cutler jersey, signed. I want you to send it to him and I want to say thank you for our business. Let's understand the intent. What most businesses would do is, if they are even into surprise and delight, shock and awe, what they would do is send something in the context of their business. I did not send this gentleman in Chicago six Riedel wine glasses. I did not send him a little wine starter kit or a nice bottle of Bordeaux. I went to his emotional center, not ours to his, the stuff he cared about. And this is very important because consumers are putting out data, we can watch this, consumers know it, I know somebody will ask about privacy in a minute, I'll give you that answer, and we were able to execute against it. Six weeks later, I was telling the story, nothing had happened, nothing out of the ordinary, bought a little bit, did it have one other order, substantially smaller, looked like it was a party order. I was watching, hoping I could like expand on this story as I was on tour, luckily, this is towards the tail end of it, and there has been an update. He sends Kristen emails, a super busy guy. I don't know if any of you lived in Chicago or know Chicago. There's an extremely famous wine shop in Chicago called Sam's. It was a, like the shop, the wine store. I grew up idolizing it and wanted to be as big as them. He writes us a letter, says, just want you to know I'm a really busy guy. I did get the uh, Jay Cutler jersey, you know, this is how you gotta love 2011. He wrote, OMG, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Merrill Lynch guy, OMG, you know? <laughs> he said, uh, he said uh, I just want you to know that I did a little homework and I spent close to a million dollars with Sam's in the last 15 years buying wine. I'm a very serious collector. I resell, I trade, I'm very into it. In the 15 years that I shopped with them, I never received any gesture even remotely close to this. I just want you to know that you bought the next 15 years of your business with this Jay Cutler jersey. Thank you so much. So that's awesome and it worked out. And I've got plenty of other things we've tried that have not worked out. But the reason they work out is because it was our intent. It's the way we looked at it. Too many people are looking at acquiring. They're hunting. Everybody's hunting. Everybody's looking on Twitter and they're pushing, right? Buy this, come this, I'll give you 20% off, sign up for this, check out my ebook, buy this, I got food, do this. You know, push, 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 push. What Twitter and social media have created is the first listening platform. It's so funny. When everybody thinks about social media, they think about what they're gonna say. All the magic is in what you're gonna listen to. And so I think we're living through a very interesting time. Thank you represents your welcome. How can I help you? I almost call this book manners marketing. I almost call this book guilt marketing. Because I firmly believe that a lot of you bought this book or the wine book or whatever else because I guilted you into it. <laughs> Because I paid forward so much that by the time I asked for something that was 20 bucks, it was a no-brainer. And I think that is a very fascinating thing. I think a lot of you took out time of your evenings and drove far away to be here tonight for similar reasons. And I think this is what's going to scale in business going forward. We've seen results with companies like PepsiCo and Green Mountain Coffee and the New York Jets. I mean, the Nets, which are uh, one of the worst basketball teams in the league. We're moving from New Jersey to Brooklyn and we're growing like crazy and selling tickets just because people appreciate the extra effort. <coughs> We've been bullshitted to for so long, and we have such good bullshit radars that I think we're seeing a very substantial shift in commerce in this country, and it's very early. Everything I talk about here is running a marathon. This stuff is really gonna matter three, four, seven, nine, 12 years from now. If you're looking for a quick score, go play Lotto. This isn't the place. But if you're looking to build lifetime value and build something long-term and substantial, this is the place. It's always been the place. And for the first time in a long, long time, this new technology has allowed us to scale caring, and that's gonna impact our bottom lines. So, 
with that, I'd love to open up uh, some Q&A because I don't want to just yap all night. So thank you guys so much for having me.